Speaker, um, if you don't know him, uh, you might not because he lives in Boston. But uh, David Lepalmento uh, is a good friend of mine from my time at Brightcove uh, and whoop, and working on VideoJS, uh, which, if you're not familiar, is a super cool open source video player. Um, so yeah, David Lepalmento, everybody. We'll see. Hopefully these mics work. Thank you. Does this work? All right, hold on. Phil's going to adjust my mic setup. This Jonas awesome, on the live stream the last time yeah. was like, <laughs> make sure the mics work before you actually do the introduction. I was like, of course I will. I definitely won't screw that up again. Yep. Are we good now? Yeah, okay. thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Sorry about that. My very good friend from VideoJS and Brightcove, David LaPalmento. Ah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, OK. Um, so actually, I, I noticed when we did show hands earlier for people who were at DMUX last year, there was actually a bunch of people who weren't here last year. Did any of you guys try and use the live streams? Did anybody try and watch DMUX on live stream? Nobody tried? Oh, one person. All right, well, there was like, there was like three live streams. There was a YouTube stream, there was a Twitch stream, and then I, I guess we called it like a Zen Coder Bright Cove stream. I'm not sure what we called it. If you watch that, I'm, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> it was a disaster. Um, we had just like released a uh, upgrade to a uh, project that I've been working on for a long time called Video Just Contrib HLS, which started off um, basically using Flash to transmux HLS and play it back in a browser. And we just convert it to media source extensions. And we tried it out for the first time with a live stream at DMUX 2015. And it really didn't work very well. So sorry about that. But in the past year, I've had a long time to like, fight those issues and work through that stuff. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk with you guys about today, was experiences working with media source extensions and maybe give you some tips about um, if you're thinking about using them, how you can do, be more successful in doing so. Um, so here's, here's one really challenging thing about media source extensions. What is media source extensions? Media source extensions is plural. I don't know if this is supposed to be what is media source extensions or what are media source extensions. This bothers me a lot, so I apologize. If that bothers you, I'm going to pretend like it's singular and just call it MSE from now on, but just deal with that. Um, so why is media source extensions cool? It's cool because it makes buffering something that web authors, developers, can actually manipulate and control. And in this like very complex technical diagram of how a video player works, that's like 50%. I made that on an iPad. So don't let anybody say that you can't make professional quality graphics on an iPad. Um, <laughs> so 50% now belongs to us as JavaScript web developers. That's really awesome. Um, if you're not familiar with media source extensions, if you haven't used it in the past, basically, here it is. There you go. Explanation done. Now, um, it's two things. Like, ignore the whole bottom half of this diagram, because most of the time you don't have to worry about that. It's two things. It is a thing called a media source, which is a container for these other things called source buffers. And source buffers are the abstraction that you put video and audio data into. You take that media source, which you've attached your source buffers to, and you attach that to a video element. And then instead of pulling from a URL that you've loaded into the video element using the source attribute, it will pull the data from those source buffers. Right? Um, that's it. That's how it works. So why is this interesting? Well, one person, when I was actually practicing this talk, told me that this term, progressive download, may not be like a universally used term. Maybe that's something we just do at Brightcove. Um, but progressive download to me, that means like MP4s, WebM files. It's the, uh, the old video files that you could just put as your source attribute in any browser and it plays. It kind of works. You can almost think of it like you know, JPEGs or images work. Technically, the browser could just sit there and download the entire file and play through it. right? Um, that's not a great way to deliver video. And if you're doing it on the web today, I think you're doing it wrong. And the reason why is that it is guaranteed to be suboptimal user experience, right? So the one thing, a big challenge that we have in the web is when you first load up a page, it's very difficult to get information about the correct bit rate to begin playback at. And so no matter what you choose, I'm going to tell you you're going to be wrong, right? Either you go a little bit high, and then you end up sending way more bits to the client, introducing way more rebufferings. Um, or you go too low, and you end up giving them a much worse user experience. right? So no matter which way you go, you're wrong. 
the way to do it right is to use more modern formats, uh, adaptive streaming formats, and the browsers have made it clear, for the most part, that they're not going to implement those formats natively. So if you want to take advantage of all of the cool things that can be done with adaptive streaming, you're going to need to understand how media source extensions works. Um, the other thing, the final kind of point on here, is progressive download and these like native HTML video playback capabilities, they're not going anywhere, right? Like they work fine. You can play in MP4, it plays, it works great. The browser is interested on uh, pushing more features into that space. So if you want to do cool things like offline video, if you want to experiment with using different transports like WebRTC or WebSockets to deliver your video, um, or if you want to even do that manual bitrate selector that uh, Strobe was talking about earlier, you're probably going to need to use MSC to actually make that happen. So that's a good reason to, to investigate it. All right, so you decide to start using media source extensions. Media source extensions today is, I would say, persnickety. If you're not familiar with this word, it means like pedantic or fussy. And I think media source extensions today is a little bit pedantic. Um, to kind of understand one particular example, we have to talk a little bit about how video actually works. So as like a web developer, I think I like to think a video that looks like this, right? So it's, it's just this one like logical single entity, goes from zero to like say six seconds, and that's it. It's just an opaque blob. That's not how real video works. Um, we can get a little bit closer to reality if we think about video more like this, right? This is how it actually is. Video is the combination of two independent like data streams with very different qualities, right? So use one very particular compression algorithm for your video data, maybe it's like H.264, use a totally different one for audio. And those two uh, sorts of data have different properties. This is still not accurate. If you're actually looking at real videos, what you're probably looking at is something more like this. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, so I guess you guys are familiar with this problem. So, Video has a sampling rate, right? It may be 24 frames per second if you're talking about like a, a movie stuff or 29.97 if it's a, you know, US television. Audio has a totally different sampling rate, right? It has 24 kilohertz, 48 kilohertz, whatever. There's a bunch of them. If you try and chop that video off, you're necessarily going to have a little bit of jaggedness at the edges, right? And so that little bit of jaggedness seems like no problem. And 99% of the time, you never have to worry about this stuff. If you're using media source extensions, you might have to worry about this stuff. And the reason why is this delightful animation right here. Um, sometimes, let's imagine you're switching quality levels. What you're going to run into is a situation where you have one quality level that has a little bit of video that sticks out, and you're switching to one that also has a little bit of video sticking out. And that gap in the, there between the audio, or vice versa for the bottom diagram, that shows up in media source extensions as a gap in your buffered ranges. When your player hits that point, it just stops, right? It stalls and waits, potentially forever. Um, this happens more frequently than I wish it would happen. It happens a lot, actually, in, in a bunch of the content that we use and play back at Brightcove. Um, and so we've tried a whole bunch of things to address this particular limitation. So one of them, this is kind of a crazy experiment, is we actually, in JavaScript client-side, generated silence audio frames. So we had a little bit of code that at all but different sampling rates would insert silent audio samples to cover this gap period, right? Um, to do that, you have to know a lot about what codecs you're using, right? You have to generate AAC samples, and you have to do it all different sampling rates. We didn't even try, well, actually, we did try for H.264. That was a mess. We, we gave up on that experiment. <laughs> this is hard, um, and I don't think that it makes sense as a player developer to have to actually like, be encoding video or audio frames on the fly. Not my favorite solution. Um, the one that we're using right now, which if you're going in this direction and you want to work around this particular problem, I would suggest is kind of an ugly hack, which is just a gap skipper. So monitor playback. If you ever hit one of these uh, periods where you're up against a tiny little gap in the buffer, if the user has sat there and waited through that buffer gap, which is probably like a tenth of a second or maybe less, just go ahead and seek over it, right? Playback continues, fantastic, it works. Um, that is surprisingly effective. The only thing that is, uh, I would say, a downside of that is it introduces seeking and seeked events um, all over the place. That's a little bit weird. If you have analytics that are monitoring playback, that's going to look strange. Um, it seems like the best solution we've come up with so far, though, so personally I would head in that direction and not attempt to you know, write 
uh, H.264 frames on the fly in JavaScript. That seems a little crazy. All right. So media source extensions, it's also a bit tight-lipped. It doesn't tell you a ton about what's happening. And when it does tell you something, it says that. <laughs> um, so it's just, that is not a lot of info. It's just one tiny little piece of information. Something broke, no idea what. Um, there are some tools that you can use to get more information. So first one, if you haven't tried this out, you should definitely learn about it. Chrome Media Internals, if you're using Chrome, super useful tool. Hopefully your problem actually does exist in Chrome, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. Um, I have heard <laughs> Firefox has an extension called About Media, which I have not personally tried, but I'm going to try immediately after uh, this, because any additional tools you get inside here is really helpful. So this is um, a delightful test pattern. I'm going to mute the volume, and doing this on the second screen is super hard, so let's see how well I can accomplish this. But I was going to give you guys a little tour of um, how media source, or how media internals works. Media, has somebody done this before? Yes, okay, cool. So um, up here at the top, you will see a whole bunch of listing of recent players. This grows down, so because we just make it bigger, Oh, I need, need to make it full screen. Okay. Yeah, I can probably do that. Boop. Okay. So. <laughs> oh. All right. Yeah, I know how to do that, too. I'm pretty computer savvy. <laughs> okay. So down here at the bottom, that's the most recent player. That's the one we just hit play on. If you click this, you get a ton. Is this big enough, by the way? Maybe a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. Let's. We're going huge. All right, so this up at the top is kind of your view on the current status of this particular video player. And uh, you can see a whole bunch of interesting stuff. So notice that we're playing right now. We can see that we're using the FFmpeg audio decoder, GPU video decoding, um, codec name. Uh, let's see, what else is on here? Oh, there we go. We have the codec information for audio. That might be handy. And it's 22.5 kilohertz, so that's cool. Below this is a running log of information about playback, right? And so actually, we can see an example right here where Chrome is telling us we did something kind of stupid. You know, for this particular project, we're transmuxing HLS into fragmented MP4s in the client in order to play the stuff back. And sometimes we screw up with PTSDTS. And when that happens, you'll see little errors there. So maybe we'll go fix that. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Chrome plays through it, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so anyways, if you do run into a decode error, there will often be a little bit of extra information here. Hopefully, that will point you in the right direction, what you need to change, what you need to do. Maybe it's uh, how you need to transform your content to make that usable. All right, so let me get rid of this, and we'll head back over to the slides and stop this video from playing. So the other uh, challenge that I find with all of video-related tools is they want to present you with a view which is kind of abstracted away from the file format, the actual serialized form of the video. And unfortunately today, just because of the way the media source extensions is evolving and it's, uh, all the browsers are currently like trying to standardize their behavior, many times you actually do need to understand details of how the video is serialized to understand where your problem lies. So even if you pull out FFmpeg right, and you go into it, it's just going to tell you things like, you have video and audio stream, here's the codex, um, and here's the frame information. What it doesn't show you is how does that actually uh, manifest itself in an MP4, and you can run into problems with incompatibilities where the actual like MP4 serialization is important. For instance, you have to use MOOF relative addressing in your sample table when you build up an MP4. <coughs> FFmpeg is not going to tell you whether you used MOOF relative addressing. So we've built a... Uh, suite of tools in the process of building our uh, HLS playback engine, which has a name that I'm not going to explain because it is goofy inside joke, but thumb coil is the what you can, how you can pronounce it. Um, this is the same tools that we've used. It is, uh, you can go check it out yourself. Let me click over here. Just a website, you upload a video and it will actually show you kind of an interactive uh, representation of how that video is actually laid out by inspecting the file itself. So this doesn't go to a server. It's actually all client-side. I mean, we have this 
file uploader thing, but you're not actually sharing your content. It just happens all locally. So let me see if I can uh, do that real quick, and I'll just show you how it works. Oh, look at this, perfect. So it works with uh, MP4s and MPEG2 transport streams. If you've ever looked at an MP4, it is compro comprised of this hierarchical collection of things called boxes or atoms, right? There's a whole bunch of them. And uh, you can see here, let's see, what is going on here? Okay, let's go into the move atom, because that has some interesting stuff. You can click your way down and look at a whole bunch of different information about uh, the video itself. And you can see things like the track information, um, the sampling rates and codecs, all that kind of stuff, how it actually gets represented in the individual MP4 file format, if you're curious. Um, we can also do this with the MPEG2 TS file, and I think this is kind of interesting. If you've never seen what a TS file looks like, it's very different from MP4. Right, so uh, MPEG-2 transport stream is designed to be streaming, right? So instead of having this kind of like hierarchy, which is all self-contained and um, one atomic unit, it's just a series of packets that it throws at you, uh, <coughs> throws at the decoder during playback. And that's kind of how this is working. So the blue uh, boxes here, those are metadata about like how many audio tracks, how many video tracks there are, and like what their identifiers are. But then you just see a stream of video and audio packets, right? And this is, uh, this is how MPEG-2 transport stream works. Kind of cool. There's a lot of it. Yippee. OK. We're not gonna, I'm not going to force you guys like, to bug an MPEG-2 TS problem during this demo. OK. All right, so that's one way you can get information about media or decode. There's two ways, actually, if you run into them in practice. So finally, um, MSE is easily flustered, I would say. Um, and I guess it reminds me of. Uh, I don't know if you guys, all of you remember uh, XHTML, but like way back in the day, we had this like effort. We decided, you know what, HTML, it's like sloppy, it's dirty, it's written by humans, it's just tag soup, it's disgusting. What we're going to do is we're going to standardize it. We're going to make it strict. It can be generated by machines. It'll be super uniform. It's just going to be amazing, and it's going to change you know, the way the web works. Problem was this thing over here, which used to be called yellow screen to death. I think this is from Firefox. But basically, we, the browsers, it was, all right. <laughs> the browsers started validating this XHTML. If there was a validation problem, they would throw an exception, right? The thing is, humans and the content that we created, it just didn't fit into this model. No one was willing, you know, even the machines that were generating XHTML would have XML production errors, and it just meant your whole page blew up as opposed to previously where it would play through. So MSE kind of has this problem right now, um, wherein if there's a problem, you get that media or decode, and you're done. You're out of luck. You got to figure something else out. So a couple strategies to deal with this. Um, one of them is go ahead and just make a new media source, make your source buffers all over again, fill them up with content, reattach them to the video, seek to back where you were, now you can start playing again. So if that sounded like really long and complicated, it is, and it also takes a while. It's very evident to your users what's going on during that process. Um, but it does work. It's, it's effective, right? And as a last ditch effort to try and save playback, I think it's worth a shot. Um, the other one is to take uh, kind of, to be very, very careful about what you end up appending to the video element, like super careful. So those inspection tools that I was showing you, one of which kind of made that visual uh, diagram of MP4 and MPEG2TS, we use those to kind of validate a whole bunch of uh, properties that we know have compatibility problems on different platforms. So up until, uh, well, for instance, Chrome used to have an issue where if you were using a AAC uh, audio codec, you couldn't switch the AAC LC, the like, uh, uh, low bit rate version of the codec on the fly. If you attempted to do that, media error decode. We would go ahead and check and make sure codecs line up. If they don't, blacklist that particular quality level. We cannot possibly switch to it. So if we started with AAC, we couldn't switch to AAC LC or vice versa. Um, that's the strategy that we're using today. Problem with this is, is that there is some content which is just uh, totally incompatible or it, you know, browser bugs that run into this and you end up with having to kill playback because you have no choice. Um, so not really great. The other thing you can do is if you're starting from scratch today, if you are like building your library, you can make sure that you transcode it for 
media source extensions. And so what I would say is use consistent codecs. So like just stick with main H.264 if that's what you're going with and don't mix AC, LC, and AC. Just do the same thing. Um, definitely take your content and deliver it unmuxed. Make sure that um, you know, your audio and your video are separate. That will uh, help you avoid a whole bunch of those gap problems, right? Because it's a lot easier to segment an individual stream instead of these muxed versions where you get those uh, jagged edges. Um, that's tough. Most of us aren't in a situation where we can retranscode all of our content. But uh, for some people, it is a possibility. And uh, I don't know. This one is a little bit tricky. I think, though, uh, the one like, point of uh, interest here is that the MSE authors are very, very interested in what's going to become vNext to media source extensions and dealing with some of these issues. So if you guys are getting involved with MSE, um, the repo for the spec is public. Anybody can file an issue. Anybody can upvote issues and, and you know, note that you're running into them too. And I know that everyone is very, uh, very uh, interested in making sure that this API is super easy to use because it's something I think everybody should be using. So, my pet issues are, uh, one, I think that continuity problem is, is a real challenge, and we should do something about that. There's a proposal to just go ahead and play through those kind of gaps, just let them ride. Um, that's number 160. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, create some runtime inspection APIs. I think it's really weird that we're building tools to inspect video in JavaScript. Like That doesn't seem like the most efficient thing, especially considering the browsers have all those tools built in. So um, if that sounds interesting, and that's number 35. And then finally, I think the biggest one is error recovery, right? We do need a way to say, OK, we made a mistake. We passed in some bad data. Let's get back to a good state and get through playback um, without having to reconstruct media sources and recreate source buffers and all that stuff. So um, yeah, go check it out. Participate. I think everyone would appreciate the feedback that you have about how MSC should work in the future. And I think I'm a little short on time, but that is it. So thanks a bunch, and I can answer questions if you guys have them. Thank you. We'll start here. So uh, in the old days of um, multimedia delivery, things like compact discs, DVDs, broadcast television, there was always a concept uh, in those formats of error concealment. So in other words, on the player, it's the job to, um, no matter what, keep playing. I agree with that, yeah. <laughs> conceal any errors. Um, so I think these proposals are great, but are you aware of any other kind of uh, standards, now that the web browser is the video player, mm -hmm. um, to unify that concept and get all the web browsers to um, be as resilient and uh, as possible to, to play through errors and handle them? I think, well, my impression is all the browser vendors want to be in that place. Like, that everyone wants to make sure that media source extensions is robust enough, that it's super easy to play back, and the player gets to do its job, which is like always be playing, right? Yeah. Um, I think the best place to like talk about that is probably in the W3C's uh, GitHub repo. So that's where I'd say go if you have ideas about ways to make that a reality. This is sort of a 101 question. Um, are the only formats that you can play out of the browser uh, H.264, MPEG, 2TS, or is there like a, I don't know, even less codec-y, more just pixels like format? Um, well, no, it's not just H.264. Like uh, VP9, I'm pretty sure, is supported in a number of browsers through MSC. It just it happens to be that my experience is dealing with H.264 content. Um, but uh, I think that most of the codecs that are supported for native playback are also supported for MSE for the most part. It's the container formats are a little bit, um, there's only, right now it's MP4, right? And uh, well, I guess WebM is also a possibility, yeah. Um, for like experimental codecs, I think that's something that, you know, you probably would be better off using like Canvas or something like that to implement. Yeah, if you're building your own decoder, that sort of thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of challenge a little bit some of your statements about uh, progressive download. Okay. Um, there are durations at which progressive download actually makes more sense. Um, and if you're not doing long format content, if mm -hmm. your content is less than, we're looking at you know five to seven minutes. Yeah. Um, especially with some of the older transportation segment lengths, you're spending ten seconds, you know, or, uh, and sometimes more, just 
trying to ramp up in uh, uh, um, in an HLS environment, ramping up to the desired bit rate um, or the, the 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 bit rate that can be handled by the 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 user's connection and and hardware. Mm -hmm. And so you're spending time looking at you know depending on the the number of uh, renditions that are in that. Um, that master manifest, looking at you know, blown up, crappy square pixels, um, or crappy squares, rather than just looking at what you, the the user intended to look at in the first place, which is a beautiful 1080p video. Um, yeah. So okay, uh, here's what I would say. The one thing about like the adaptive streaming formats that are out there right now is they all have a manifest, which typically introduces like a second round trip or possibly multiple round trips before you actually start playback. And uh, I think it's totally reasonable to say if you have really short content, like I would say like 10 to 30 seconds, that the overhead of that manifest request is uh, probably not worth it. Um, however, for the kind of like the second half of what you just mentioned about ramping up your ABR algorithm, I think that also, it, that says to me that your ABR algorithm didn't make a good initial selection. And like you could design one that started off just at the right bit rate that you would have chosen if you were choosing just a straight MP4. Um, but as with like all engineering decisions, there are trade-offs. And so you're absolutely right. There are some scenarios where like old progressive download style videos are a totally reasonable option. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting shaking of head up front. So maybe there's some controversy on this point, but I could see yeah. it. I could see you can make an argument for it. And yeah. I, I guess so we were using Brightcove's uh, original flash uh, uh, to uh, HLS mm -hmm. um, and it was an unmitigated disaster. Oh. Uh, so um, the reason we're using progressive download for yeah. the last 18 months has largely been our experience as a result of the flash-based HLS. Well, now what I will yeah. say is the MSE-based HLS is like night and day. Mm. Uh, it is substantially more performant. The um, <laughs> um, the one of, for us, one of the things was that um, our users click around within the video. Mm -hmm. they're, they're jumping around to get to the bit in the walkthrough that is relevant to them. Or our own internal users are literally skipping around in the video to find that quintessential thumbnail that describes, you know, that best represents that video. And so seek time was super important to us. And seek time in progressive download is phenomenal. Hmm. Seek time in flash-based HLS was not good. Torture. Yeah. Uh, well, so um, the, one of the for us one of the key th one of the key performance indicators uh, is whether you know how, how is the seek time? Mm -hmm. How quickly do we get to that first frame of that uh, that point in the video? Uh, and with MSE-based HLS, we, we it's it's substantially better with the the, the Brightcove implementation. Well, I'm glad to hear that we've improved that situation. That's, I guess, <laughs> my, my summary of feedback. And uh, I'm very sorry that the flash-based HLS didn't work out very well for you guys. Uh, we recognize that it was not great, and that's why we we're moving to MSE, and that's why I suggest everybody else do too, because it's great. So, I can't believe that flash didn't work out very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one. On the audio frayed rope type example, I'm wondering why would you not have the next um, segment available where you could just feed the decoder the next audio s segment actually and instead of putting a silence there? Why would you just not concatenate it into the decoder and keep it continuously running? And oh, offer, um, right, in that case, it has to, well, so we primarily are doing with muxed content and it's switching between quality levels and the segmenter has, you know, decided just a segment is slightly different, right? right. But I don't think that's, well, it's definitely not unusual with the content that we're doing. And um, I think like, if you haven't been transcoding your content unboxed or done it recently, you're probably going to see that situation occur. So there's some limitation there. That you can yeah. Really just do and in that. fact, we actually for a while had an algorithm that would then back up a segment, right? So like we were trying to make a quality switch. We would then back up a segment, try and grab that, and feed that to the decoder and overlay. That worked, but it was very complicated to manage. And also, it was a waste of bits, right? A significant yeah. waste of bits. It made the quality switches take longer. I went through this issue yeah. in many levels in every way, time code changing and yeah. It's, it's a mess, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, we got to move on to the next one. So, But everybody, another round of applause for David. <laughs> <laughs>